First of all, I would like to thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak here today. I have been very warmly welcomed by your congregation and by the AOTS club here. And as a preacher, I know that a preacher needs to preach, so I welcome opportunities to do so and to share reflections on the Word of God with you. It seems there was a preacher who was delivering a sermon one Sunday when he looked up and saw a young woman in the congregation texting as he was speaking. He found it disconcerting, but let it pass. And he continued on. A short time later, he looked up again and saw her head down, continuing to text away furiously. He couldn't contain himself. He had worked very hard in his preparation, and the least she could do was to pay attention. He stopped, and directing himself to her, he said, Young lady, would you mind not doing that? Her head bounded up, and she looked back at him and said, Okay, I'll stop, but all the people on my blog were really enjoying your sermon today. Times change. And what is true of the story is that our engagement with each other has changed. Our engagement with society has changed. And the church's engagement with society has also changed over time, and it will continue to do so. We think as a church. We are engaged in society as a church. The demands of mission change over time, and God's voice becomes clearer to us as we practice our discipleship. We change in response to the call of God. This is who we are as a church, as a United Church of Canada. This is how we act as a church of God. This has been and is now our spiritual practice. And change clearly emanates from the two pieces of scripture we have heard today. First, Ruth, who completely changed her circumstances. And also in our passage from Mark, where Jesus lends great insight into how to live under God and the change this means for us. Change which is clarified by the teacher of religious law. But let's back up and review. That scriptural piece from Mark contains quite a theological wallop. Jesus expounds on the greatest commandment to love God and your neighbor as yourself. The teacher of religious law who asked the original question comments wisely that this is more important than to offer all of the burnt offerings and sacrifices required by law. And Jesus then tells him that he is close to the kingdom of God. What are we to make of this? How does this compute for us? First of all, we are dealing with God in a contemporary sense as Christians, a concept of mystery and awe and wonder and personal understanding, certainly one we have seen grow and develop over time. At an AOTS conference a few years ago, every man in a workshop I attended indicated that their understanding of God has changed over time and therefore what it meant to love God and be a person of God. These are significant theological questions. How we understand what God is. The issue of the balance between personal salvation and acting in community with God. Those are important considerations for us in this united church of ours. It is the way we are. We are committed to discussion, discernment, and prayerful reflection about things. And this 
is how we come to understand what God is calling us to do. In August of 2012, at the 41st General Council, in a spirit of such prayerful reflection, the church acknowledged the presence and spirituality of Aboriginal peoples in the United Church by revising the church's crest. The crest changes included incorporating the four colors of the Aboriginal medicine wheel, yellow as a symbol of life and Asian people, black as a symbol of the South and dark-skinned people, red as a symbol of the West and Aboriginal peoples, and white as the color of the North and white-skinned people. And in addition, the Mohawk phrase, Aquinia Tetawa Nerin, was added to the crest. And that phrase is translated, all my relations. This is a significant change for the church. It is a recognition of who was and who was not invited to the basis of union of our church in 1925. It is a reflection of our sin of omission. In this respect, the addition of the phrase, all my relations, is also significant because it extends not only to human relationships, that is already covered in the, in the crest with the phrase, that all may be one, but also to our relationships with all things under God, Mother Earth, and all of God's creation. It is a reflection of how we live out our apology. But secondly, in this passage, we have this important distinction that the religious leader makes about burnt offerings and sacrifices. Loving God is more important than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices, he says. Might this be the crux of the issue of the matter? Maybe what we need to consider is what the burnt offerings and sacrifices were about. What was this process as it relates to God? Well, fundamentally, it was about sin or wrongdoing or law-breaking, transgressions against God and the law. And the burnt offerings and sacrifices represented a methodology of repentance and atonement. We are sorry, God. We have been bad, God. We repent. We come with offerings and sacrifices to, to show our atonement, God. God is with us today. <laughs> but showing our atonement is not enough. And this is where the issue becomes most challenging. Atonement requires a change in behavior. It requires a decision for God, a decision to love God and a decision to act as God would have us act. Apologies are lived out. And if they are not, they are meaningless. They are nothing more than confessions and empty declarations of repentance. Several years ago, the United States government issued a proclamation apologizing for slavery. There was only one proviso. There was no accountability attached to the apology. For all intents and purposes, the United States government was saying, this doesn't change anything. Don't try to take this to the bank. We apologize for the 400 years of kidnapping, enslavement, murder, rape, and plunder of your people, but don't try to use this expression as proof of your right for economic consideration or anything else. 
We apologize, but we won't be accountable. These are hollow words at best. And this is why the love of God is more important than burnt offerings for God. In the first instance, we honor God by not committing the sin or wrongdoing in the first place, or at least avoiding it again in the future. In the second, we ask for forgiveness, having committed the sin, having broken the law, committed the crime, having turned our back on God. To the religious leader of Jesus' time, burnt offerings, perhaps, were more a statement about how we did not love God than evidence that we now do. In talking about the commission of sin and wrongdoing and law-breaking, we need to recognize as well that our proclivity is to speak about the commission of sins, and it often disguises the fact that we sin by omission as well. It is not just what we do, but often what we don't do. Which brings us to Ruth, who did not omit Naomi. Ruth who teaches that loving God is more important than paying homage to God, that loving God is more important than believing in God. It is about deciding on God, especially at those moments in time when it makes all the difference, when saying nothing is far from enough, and when it is important to say Your people are my people. Your God, my God. 